So I'm currently a postdoc at Stanford University. I'm working at the IRIS lab. Uh, and in this lab, we're basically interested uh, to learn uh, broad intelligent behavior through learning and interaction. Uh, and we work most on robotic and machine learning application. I am a Wallenberg postdoctoral flow, flow there, uh, which means that uh, I am supported by Wallenberg for two years at Stanford, and then followed by another two years in Sweden. So it's a very nice uh, um, option. And uh, if you haven't thought about it, I really recommend you to also look at it and uh, try to see if you can apply for the same uh, flowship. If you're still interested to do another postdoc. I'm also at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, uh, Division of Robotic Perception and Learning. Uh, in this picture, you can see the main areas of, of RPL. I myself am working mostly on computer vision and machine learning, um, grasping and manipulation, and decision making. I'm not working a lot with social robotics, but still, you still can see a picture of me here working together with another uh, with a robot here. Um, I am uh, having uh, two projects uh, ongoing at KTH. One is a Canopus EU project um, in which we're developing machine learning algorithm for ha harvesting application. And uh, also have, uh, it's uh, the other project COIN is uh, almost uh, finished. And in that project, we were interested in understanding um, co-adaptation between human robots and human and robot interaction scenario. I'm also leading a research group uh, at RPL about a brain computer interface. You can see a picture in the right. Today, my topic is not about brain computer interface, but um, that's actually a very active research for me here at RPL. Um, I have, uh, I'm supervising two students uh, in the BCI research and also one another student uh, at the Canopus EU project. So yeah, that is a very, very short uh, introduction about myself. Let me just uh, move on to the main topic for today, which is uh, reinforcement learning and making RL agent more data efficient for robotics. Uh, let me start very briefly about uh, the general um, uh, problem formulation for reinforcement learning. We're assuming that we have an agent and an environment. Um, the agent perform action and uh, the environment respond to the action by giving back states and reward to the agent. <laughs> so uh, our goal here is to uh, learn an action decision selection policy which is denoted by pi, uh, in which condition on the state of the environment we, we will help us to um, uh, understand what action to select mm -hmm. now. Uh, our goal here is to basically maximize the expected return uh, condition on the policy that we have learned so far. Uh, here's a robotic example of the setting. Um, in this particular example, uh, the state of the system are robot joint position and velocities, for example, uh, that can be measured uh, from uh, the robot hardware. And also we can uh, provide, uh, in this particular example, we're, for example, interested in shooting a hockey uh, puck into different goal position. So therefore, the initial puck position uh, can also be interesting to give as a state to the agent and that can be provided by camera images. Uh, the actions can be like uh, finding uh, uh, motor outputs for this robotic manipulator. There are seven joints, so we will uh, working with continuous seven dimensional action spaces here. And the reward can be, for example, constructed based on the final park position, if it lands on the, on the target position or not. So that is like a very general um, formulation of the problem and how this is that this can be related to robotics. Um, deep reinforcement learning has been successful in recent years in many different areas, including, for example, Atari games, uh, in which uh, we could train a, an, an agent that can uh, play with uh, raw images and uh, perform more or less similar to the level of a human player. 
Um, another success, a story for reinforcement learning has been uh, the game of Goo, in which uh, AlphaGoo algorithm could win against an, a human champion in the game of Goo. Uh, Duta 2 is another example. Uh, and also we have uh, been successfully applied deep reinforcement learning in many different uh, simulated environments that are mostly built on uh, top of, for example, physics engines, physics engines, for example, Mojoko. Uh, but still, uh, there is a prop, there are lots of problems when it comes to robotics. There are many challenges that um, that are particularly for specific for robotic application. The first challenge is not uh, that it not, is not does not exist in the other example that I just provided is for example the safety problem. Uh, you can't really run uh, anything uh, an arbitrary policy on a robotic manipulator. It's not safe. It, the robot can damage itself uh, or its environment. Um, if we can't collect too much samples from a real physical system, a problem that I uh, mentioned it as data efficiency problem or challenge, you have to learn a, a good policy provided very limited um, amount of uh, data that you can sample from a real hardware. Uh, we have exploration problem which is somehow also linked to the safety because we can't let the robot to randomly explore its environment. Um, credit assignment problem, uh, that is more profound here because of the data efficiency problem. In typical reinforcement learning, uh, we can basically uh, sample a lot of online data from the, uh, from the environment. Therefore, we can learn how to assign credits to different actions. But when we have a data efficiency limitation, then credit assignment can, can also be a problem. Uh, another thing is reward shaping. Uh, unlike the games that I just mentioned, uh, we don't have a nice reward that's given by the game, and we have to somehow engineer a reward function that will help us to learn efficiently for a given task, and that's not uh, very obvious how to do this reward shaping. For example, in this particular example, a PhD student of mine started to um, to devise the reward for this simple task. So he first came up with the idea, okay, uh, we should uh, penalize the, the, the distance of the final puck position to the target position. That didn't work. Then uh, uh, added like penalty to uh, make sure that the uh, agent touches the puck, give it some velocity. Then another penalty term not to hit the tabletop, not to hit itself, minimize energy consumption. And at the end, he came up with about 25 different reward terms. And finally, we could not really optimize all of them together. So that's, I would say, another big problem in uh, reinforcement learning. And finally, uh, generalization. You would expect uh, a policy which is learned, for example, in this setting to, to also work in a different setting. But again, because of the lack of uh, data and the problem of uh, basically um, that we need to collect more online samples to learn a policy. This is a very challenging um, goal to achieve generalization for robotics in, in deep reinforcement learning settings. Okay, today's talk, I'm gonna talk about two different topics. One is reinforcement learning using generative models. I'm just gonna introduce an approach that can help us to learn more efficiently uh, for robotics, robotic application by using generative models. And second topic is gonna to be about meta learning to improve uh, transferring, for example, from simulation to real world and also to, to transfer across different robotic platforms. Okay, let me start with a little bit background about generative models. So I'm uh, starting with like uh, one of the main application, very typical application of uh, generative model, which is to generate human photorealistic human faces. In this case, um, uh, we are basically, we can assume that there is a latent variable, which is unknown uh, that can characterize our data. So here you can see different faces. Um, even though that there's like the same structure, like uh, there are always two eyes, nose and mouth, but still there's some uh, variation in the data that 
potentially can capture can be captured by a latent variable and we are assuming that there is such a latent variable that is basically characterizes different characteristic of this uh, of our data so our goal here is to maximize the look likelihood of data uh, or better to say to learn a model that maximizes the look likelihood of the data um, this can be done by uh, marginalizing over the latent variable and again remember that uh, we don't know anything. I mean, it's completely unknown variable at this point. Uh, we can introduce a variational distribution, QZ. And after a little bit of math and using Jensen inequality, we can maximize the look like of data by maximizing the variational lower bound, which is given here. I'm going to go into more details in, uh, in the next slide. So this guy here is called variational lower bound. Um, Good, then we would like to, in order to maximize the look likelihood of data, we ended up maximizing the variational lower bound. How do we, how we do that? One way to do is by using something called variational autoencoders in which uh, we, uh, we have an encoder network that first try to um, uh, learn a distribution over uh, the latent space, latent variable condition on our data and then Conditioning on the latent variable, try to generate to reconstruct the data at the output again. So basically, we are trying to reconstruct the input at the output again by passing all the information through an information bottleneck, which is uh, our latent space. Uh, the interesting thing uh, about VAEs is basically this uh, KL divergence term, which try to uh, make sure that the distribution over the latent space is uh, as close as possible to a prior distribution, which is normally set as an as a standard normal uh, distribution. There's another way that we can also learn um, generative models based on latent variables, and that's uh, something which is typically known as generative adversarial networks. In this case, uh, we're again sampling from a latent space typically a low dimensional latent space, pass the samples to the generative model and generate a bunch of images. We call them fake generated images. And then uh, we also provide some real images from our data set and train another discriminator that tries to discriminate if the images are from the real distribution or they're the fake ones generated by the, by the generative model. And uh, then by training these two guys together, discriminator and the generative model, we will converge to a, to a situation in which the discriminator is no longer able to discriminate the image, real images from the fake ones, which means that uh, we should have captured the, the, the distribution of the real data. Uh, okay, good. That is like the summary that I need to, um, uh, to that you need to remember for, for the rest of this presentation. Um, we would like to basically learn the a generative process that condition on a latent variable can generate our images. Here is one example that you can just uh, uh, change uh, the, the, the latent variable. And uh, based on that, you can generate different human faces. If you're sampling close latent variables, you can expect that um, the images that are generated can be somehow similar. But for very different latent variables, you can expect that uh, you can generate completely different outputs. So this is the properties that uh, we would need for um, the rest of uh, our uh, derivation to derive a, a formulation for generating models and reinforcement learning. Okay, great. Uh, now let's talk about uh, reinforcement learning. Our goal, as I said before, is to train a policy that uh, condition on some observation or states can generate a sequence of trajectories I just called tau, denoted by tau, uh, that would result in uh, high final terminal rewards. So I, I mentioned uh, trajectories here because um, uh, you can consider uh, having an action space of seven dimension for the robotic arm. And then you need to find, let's say uh, 200 time steps of, uh, of the seven different motor actions, which in total will be about 700 if I said 100 times seven, it will be 700 uh, different actions that you need to find in order to learn how to shoot the poke. And one way to do that is to just learn the, the entire trajectory once. 
So that's why this policy is assigning a distribution over the trajectory space. And uh, the environment we're assuming uh, is like um, a probabilistic model that assign uh, distribution over rewards, condition on the our initial observation and the trajectory that are chosen by the robot. Okay, our goal is to maximize the local likelihood of the reward. And uh, this again can be, uh, uh, can be done by integrating over all possible trajectories and uh, the, li the likelihood of, um, this, of each particular trajectory under the policy, which is parameterized by capital theta here and time and multiply it by uh, the word uh, probability. Uh, okay. This problem uh, before going, it's gonna be um, very complicated and uh, there's no tractable solution to this. The first reason is that trajectories are very high dimensional and we can't really marginalize over trajectories like this. Uh, one way we can actually um, solve this problem is by uh, using some sort of human demonstration or offline data and uh, use this offline data set to learn uh, the distribution uh, over possible actions or trajectories. I will call it low-level policy in the rest of this presentation. And basically this is where we need generator models. And then finally, we can train a high-level policy on top of the low-level policy or the generative model that would learn how to assign uh, different latent variables to different states in order to solve the task successfully. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, uh, our uh, objective now. Uh, since we are using this generative model here, and uh, here, this is the, our latent variable, very similar to the latent variable that I just introduced in, our, in my previous slides. Uh, if you remember, when we were sampling the latent variable for the previous example, we were able to generate different human faces. Here, our latent variable will, uh, if it's passed through the generative model, it will generate different trajectories. And again, latent variables that are close to each other will generate trajectories that are close to each other, and latent variables far, far apart from each other will generate completely different trajectories. So then um, if you look back at this uh, marginalization, this time we can marginalize over the latent variable, which is much lower dimension compared to the trajectories. If you remember, trajectories could have like a very high dimensional, like 700 different dimension, but this time um, we can limit it to, let's say two or three dimension for this particular task. And, uh, and then uh, we are using our uh, generative model to generate trajectories that are similar to the ones that we provide uh, in our data set. Okay, there are some uh, benefits of such formulation. Uh, first of all, we will deal with low dimensional action spaces. We're not uh, working with high dimensional trajectories anymore. There's no temporal complexity. And as a result, there's no crude assignment problem anymore uh, because uh, one latent variable will basically model the entire trajectory of the uh, of the of the robot, so therefore we don't have any temporal complexity anymore. Uh, it's safe and efficient exploration. It's safe because the generative model only generates trajectories that are similar to the ones that are provided in the uh, in, in our demonstration. And and if you assume that those uh, demonstrations were safe, we can also expect the generative model to generate uh, somehow safe uh, trajectories. And it's more efficient exploration because you're not really doing random exploration. If you're randomly searching in the latent space of this generative model here, you're still gonna get uh, meaningful trajectories. So it's not like uh, completely random trajectories. And this will of course provide a very good uh, uh, way for us to uh, incorporate <clears throat> prior human knowledge into our pulse training formulation. Um, good. Then uh, this is again our policy now, which itself consists of two parts. One is generated model, the other is the sub policy or high level policy that assign a distribution over the latent variable condition on the state. Um, I've already told the two, I've already introduced two different ways to train the generative model. And next, we can talk a little bit more about how we can train the other part of the policy, which is the sub policy that assign distribution over latent variable, condition on the state or observation. 
Um, again, similar to what I described before, we can introduce a variational policy and we can do the same kind of math in order to find, uh, uh, to derive an objective which can be used for uh, the policy training problem. Um, okay, this look likelihood over reward then can be, can be decomposed into two parts. One is a lower bound, the other is a KL divergence term, which is a non-negative term. And because if this is non-negative, this is a lower bound. And now we can maximize our reward, probability over reward in two step by first maximizing the lower bound and then uh, maximizing, uh, sorry, by first maximizing the lower bound by minimizing the KL divergence term, which means to make uh, um, uh, the two distribution as close as possible to each other. And then uh, directly maximizing the lower bound by updating the, the theta parameter. I'm gonna go into details of these two uh, steps. First, uh, the first step is expectation step. By the way, I forgot to say that we are using expectation maximization algorithm. In the, in the, expectation, in the expectation step, we try to minimize the, this KL divergence term, which will indirectly maximize the lower bound because the left-hand side is not depending on, does not depend on um, the variational distribution. So if we minimize this term with respect to variational distribution, this side will, will remain fixed. This is going uh, to, to, be, to be lowered and therefore this guy will be increased. So that's why we're, that's the way that we're indirectly maximizing our uh, lower bound in the E step. After a little bit of math, then um, the lower bound, uh, sorry, the E step objective will be um, uh, decomposed into two parts. One is reward seeking, which means to optimize our variational distribution such that uh, we will have more, more uh, likely rewards under the variational distribution. And there's another, term, which is trust region term, which is telling the variational distribution to stay close to the, our deep policy. Um, again, I have to just um, skip some details. Uh, here, I'm going to talk about maximization stuff, which, is, which, are, which we are uh, directly maximizing the lower bound by optimizing the, the, the parameters of the deep policy. This can be done in supervised learning. Uh, after a little bit of math, you will see that it's simply mi minimizing the KL divergence term between uh, the variational policy, which was updated in the previous step, and uh, the deep policy that we are trying to update in this step. So, in summary, we can train uh, the parameters of the policy theta in two steps by iterating, iterating between expectation step and maximization step. In the expectation step, we're trying to update the variational policy based on these two terms, that is try to maximize the reward. Well, is there any question? Okay. Um, we're trying to basically uh, maximize our reward while staying in the trust region of the policy, the policy, and in the maximization step, we're using supervised learning uh, loss to update the deep policy to, to, to stay as close as possible to the variational uh, policy. Um, okay, I've already told how to train the generative model, so I'm gonna skip uh, that part, but one, very quick question, where data comes from to train the generative model? We can basically uh, train a blind controller. For example, if you wanna pick objects from a tabletop, you can just generate such data in simulation and record the data for uh, to train the generative model. Um, next question is about uh, the perception side. Uh, first of all, what the perception does, perception, try to learn a good representation of our initial observation. So in the case that uh, uh, we are basically using camera images to represent an object um, that is given to the policy, then uh, these camera images can contain a lot of data, which is not very uh, easy to process. And uh, as a result, typically we learn another perception network that tries to find a low dimensional representation of the uh, initial observation that can be passed to the sub policy here. 
So um, first, let me explain what the problem is. Uh, it's quite easy to train a policy in this kind of setting. As you can see, the, the object of interest is quite uh, um, uh, in, in high contrast to the background. It doesn't have uh, too much uh, features. So, um, or better to say texture. So it's not that difficult to basically learn a policy in this kind of situation. Um, but the problem is that when you want to generalize to unseen condition, in which we may have some background clutter and we may um, encounter novel task objects that has not been seen before. So the question is that how we can basically learn a policy in this setting that can, that can transfer well to the other comp more complicated but more realistic setting. Um, here I'm gonna talk about a very simple idea based on adversarial training. So, um, uh, remember, uh, in ad generative adversarial training, we had a discriminator, which was trying to say if uh, the generated contents come from the generative model or it come from the real data distribution. Here, uh, we can use a very similar ID to basically um, uh, learn uh, a, a model that tried to extract some useful feature from the images. Then the features can come from two different sources. One source is our uh, simple data set that contain that there's no without any uh, background plotter, contain only one task object. And another set of images uh, we will have is like uh, a more realistic setting in which we have a lot of different objects and uh, we may have different type of task objects in those images. And uh, the thing here is that we would like uh, the features that come from these images to be as similar as possible to the features that come from the other set of images. So therefore we are training a discriminator that tries to discriminate the source of data and uh, the generative model here is the model that tries to extract a set of features in case that we can uh, basically uh, confuse the discriminator not to discriminate the, uh, the features that come from the two sources, then we can say that the features are identical and therefore we can say, give the same exact same features to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the policy. This will ensure that the policy would behave similar no matter if you're giving these images or the other images. And that's a way that we could uh, successfully uh, use uh, to zero shot transfer a policy which is learned in this condition to a more sophisticated condition like this. Here are some uh, videos of uh, how these IDs are working in practice on some uh, real robot example or simulation environment. So for these examples, um, uh, we can learn uh, such policies after only uh, about, I guess, thousand different trials and uh, which is quite uh, possible uh, to collect this amount of data in about a um, few hours of training. And I guess in this, uh, for these two, two other uh, uh, examples, I also, this is what I did during my PhD. And I guess uh, for these examples, I, I collected about uh, one and a half hour of data for each of these tasks. Good. Um, <clears throat> next, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can uh, apply the same kind of EM uh, uh, policy training algorithm to learn a task that consists of multiple kind of behaviors. So uh, assume that uh, our task is to learn um, uh, moving in this kind of uh, situation, which requires different type of um, uh, basically uh, different skills for uh, crossing over the object or uh, crossing around the object. And uh, we can basically learn each individual skill separately and then use the same expectation maximization algorithm to learn uh, to combine all these different skills together. Here is just some, uh, some examples of how this algorithm would perform uh, if you combine different skills based on the EM algorithm as if you, comp as if you just done them uh, using regular uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, 
I guess here's a short video of the final uh, policy, which is learned by combining different skills uh, separately from each other. And uh, finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, uh, reinforcement learning, this generative model is um, offline, the topic of offline reinforcement learning. So in offline setting, we are assuming that we don't have any access to the real environment, and we only have to train, have to learn a policy from an offline data set, which has been pre-recorded. The offline data set can contain human demonstration. It can contain um, uh, uh, other previous trials uh, of, re of other reinforcement learning on the same task or, our, or on other similar tasks, but different ones. Uh, that's the way that we typically construct our offline data set. And uh, the question is that how we can learn from this offline data set without having any interaction, online interaction with the real setting. This is particularly very interesting for robotic uh, problem formulations because uh, we will uh, avoid all the problem about uh, safety, exploration, and uh, all this thing that makes uh, reinforcement learning for robotics complicated. Okay, and then how we can do this. First, um, there is like a category of problem of, of solution, which is called off policy reinforcement learning. And what it does basically, um, it tries to learn an action value function here is denoted by Q, uh, uh, such that um, uh, we can understand uh, the value of every uh, state and action pair at, at different time steps. Um, since I haven't uh, provided any background about this, I'll try to make it very short and but just try to give you a very general ID. Uh, Q learning is like a, rec a recursive algorithm that tries to construct the action value function iteratively after many, many iteration. The problem with uh, offline data set is that if you try to use this recursive algorithm, soon you will uh, start um, uh, uh, querying out of distribution actions because here uh, we are uh, in order to update the the value of the value of the state we need to basically make query to the policy and and obtain some actions that can be out of distribution from this data set and that can pro create problems because uh, at some point you still start uh, out uh, uh, out valuing the state and action pairs which can create instability uh, in your uh, in the training. So instead of doing this, uh, we can simply use generative models again, that uh, in which we can use uh, uh, basically limit the policy to stay in the, in, within the support of the training examples, very similar to what I explained so far. And in this way, we can basically make uh, Q learning uh, or off policy training stable. And uh, our experimental result, I'm not showing any unfortunate any result here, but uh, you can trust me that uh, using this trick basically makes uh, offline uh, reinforcement learning with, uh, uh, sorry, off policy reinforcement learning with offline data more stable. And we can now learn some behavior uh, by purely in an offline setting without even uh, interacting with the robot in an online setting. Okay, um, that was so far what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, generative model, reinforcement learning using generative model. My next topic uh, that I'll try to cover very quickly is meta learning to transfer train policies. I'm going to talk about two different settings. One is sim to real transfer, and the other is transfer across different robotic platforms. So let me start with first with sim to real transfer learning. So um, we're assuming that, uh, okay, uh, training on a real robot is complicated, challenging, and uh, it may require a lot of training example, which is not which we cannot afford on a real robotic hardware because of the wear and tear uh, of a physical system. One way to alleviate this problem is to use a simulator uh, in which we can basically train a policy. And after that, the, the policy training simulation, we can hope that we can transfer the learned policy into the real hardware. Uh, unfortunately, there is a, this is not that simple because um, uh, we can't really model all different dynamics that exist in the real setting in simulation. And as a result, 
uh, if you learn a policy in simulation, it can't um, uh, transfer well to the real setting. Um, there are two ways to, uh, to deal with this problem. One is to learn um, a robust model in simulation and uh, uh, how we can do that. Basically, we can um, adjust different parameters, let's say different friction, different math, and uh, all the things that we can change in the simulation and learn a policy that would be robust to all these different changes in the simulation. That's one way to go. And another way, that is that's the way that I'm gonna talk about in this slide uh, is to learn a learning agent instead. Uh, what does it mean to learn a learning agent? It, this means that we're not gonna learn a policy in, in, um, in, the, in simulation, but instead we are learning a learning agent that can train a policy based on information that it learns in simulation. So in simulation, we can create, let's say thousands of different tasks for policy training and train a learning agent that, uh, instead of, that tries to basically learn how it can optimize a policy uh, for these different thousands of uh, examples. And then uh, we can show that when we are trying to, this learning agent can transfer better than the model itself to the real setting because it can consider the, the, real, uh, the real setting as another task uh, and then uh, use the same um, uh, learning procedure that it says learn in simulation to apply to the real robot uh, to transfer, uh, to, to learn, to obtain a policy that would work on the real setting. Um, then I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, meta-learning algorithm a little bit here. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is basically optimization-based meta-learning. Um, in meta-learning or learning to learn, as I said, we're not learning a model, but we are learning a learning algorithm. <clears throat> One way is based on uh, uh, gradient descent optimization. So uh, our goal is to basically learn uh, a learning rule that after a very short fine tuning phase, we can obtain the final model. So a fine tuning will gen generally look like something like this, consists of um, uh, some sort of initialization or pre-trained parameters, a learning rate, gradient rule, a loss function, and uh, some training data for a new task. So our, then therefore we can actually have all these different uh, design choice for improving uh, fine tuning step. Um, one algorithm, which is known as uh, model agnostic uh, meta learning or MAML in short, is uh, the one that tries to learn uh, the initialization over the parameter space. And basically, the meta learning task is defined by optimizing an initialization over the task uh, given the data that here the training data are the simulation and with the final objective to uh, perform well on the test setting, which is in this case is the real, real world setting. <clears throat> uh, okay, that's like uh, our algorithm based on MAML to learn, to learn a policy on the real robot. Here are the parameters that we try to randomize in simulation, uh, X linear friction, Y friction, torsional friction, rotational friction, part mass, and also initial part position. We train um, many different tasks in simulation, uh, but instead of training tasks, we train a, a meta learner based on MAML. And uh, okay, I guess I should have some result on the real hardware. Okay, this is like uh, uh, what we got on the real hardware. That is like um, uh, some trial before even, uh, that's like the adaptation phase that the robot tries some few examples to see how we can uh, adapt these parameters. As you see, after only three trials, the robot could learn how to uh, push the puck to the target. So in a very data efficient way. So it's another uh, training trial here. Uh, that's before with a different, completely different puck. And that's after updating the policy with like only two or three examples. Okay, uh, that's uh, how it works uh, for, the sim for the simulation to the real world training. And last topic that I'm gonna talk about is about uh, multi-robot uh, 
transfer learning. So we can actually learn a policy uh, for, a, for an individual uh, robotic manipulator, as I explained here. So we, ha we have quite data efficient uh, learning algorithm that, would be, uh, that we can apply to learn different policies. But there is a problem. Uh, if we wanna just uh, transfer one skill from a robot to another, basically this is not, um, this is not possible because we will have different morphologies robotic morphologies and uh, we will have different action spaces. And this transfer from one robotic to another, one robot hardware to another, unfortunately is not uh, simply possible. And uh, whenever we wanna learn something on a different robotic platform, we have to start everything from scratch, which is not uh, very optimal. So um, next, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, how we can learn um, uh, policies that can basically transfer to multiple different robotic platform. Again, I'm gonna talk about meta learning, how we can use meta learning concept here in this setting. First, uh, let's have a look at a deep busy motor policy that maps uh, a visual observation like this to joint level motor outputs. Um, this can be decomposed into two parts. One is task specific part and the other is robot specific part. Um, so the robot specific part uh, can be basically uh, adapted to different robots, while the task specific part can be shared across different tasks. Um, here is like uh, how we do this uh, uh, this decomposition. So the task modules try to learn a representation of the input images and uh, basically that they, these can be shared across different robots, but the robot specific modules are the ones, for example, for the generated model that try to learn uh, the trajectories over the actions. They are robot specific, but uh, our goal here is to basically learn a way that we can um, uh, at the test time uh, uh, adapt the robot specific module to a completely different uh, robotic uh, platform. So this is how we do it. Uh, instead of having like uh, one robot specific module for each robot, we try to instead learn one robot agnostic uh, uh, component that uh, with the goal that this robot agnostic component should be adjustable to new robotic hardware after a few shot training phase. Uh, we again try to do it uh, using uh, some uh, a framework based on MAML. Uh, we first try to generate uh, 400 different robotic manipulator in simulation uh, by adjusting each of the existing robotic manipulator uh, by randomly adjusting the lengths and different parameters of the, of the existing robots. So we, have, we will have 100 Kinova, 100 Yumi, 100 Franca, and 100 Baxter in total 400 robots in simulation. We first uh, train uh, one policy, the, the perception component and the high level policy uh, in uh, using only one robot, which is this case, Yumi robot. And then uh, we use meta learning to train, um, to, to learn uh, uh, from uh, all different 400 robots by learning a generative model here that can be adapted quickly to a new robotic platform. And as I said before, once we have learned this initialization or the generative model, we can simply adjust them or fine tune them to a new robotic platform using future learning. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, skip some details here. But okay, uh, before I can continue, um, uh, talking about the rest of uh, uh, the the algorithm here, uh, I need to uh, describe a problem that we will have here in this kind of few shot learning. Uh, our goal, as I said, is to at the test time provide very few trajectories of the of the test robot. Let's say this is a test robot. We only want to have a few trajectories on this test robot, and then being able to adjust or fine tune the generated model to this new robotic platform. But in most cases, providing only five different trajectories or very few shot examples is going to be problematic because uh, we can't really understand the complete kinematic model of the robot based on a few shot example. This can create um, uh, problems for the, for the meta-learning algorithm. 
something which, which we call as ambiguity in the task. So before I can continue here, I would like to just describe uh, what do we mean by ambiguity in uh, meta learning in general. Let's assume that we have a future example, future learning uh, task, uh, which is um, uh, like a classification. We, we were provided five different samples as positive samples and five different other samples as negative ones. Um, so as you can see, there is something in common between um, the positive and the, the negative ones. So most of them are, uh, for example, in this case, uh, oops. In this case, uh, they have their mouth open for the positive while in the negative ones, they're all having mouth closed. Um, they have makeup in the positive, but on the other hand, they're all young. Um, if you look at the negative ones, um, we don't see, for example, they don't have makeup, they're not young, and they have their most clothes. But when we are uh, trying to make a query on a test image like this, which has makeup and a mouth open, but old, then it's, it's ambiguous to say it's if it belongs to our positive set or the negative set. This problem is known as uh, task ambiguity in meta learning algorithm and methods like monoagnostic meta learning or MAMO does not uh, cannot deal with this kind of uh, task ambiguity. Unfortunately, it gives just a deterministic solution, which is not uh, what we want, especially for this uh, for our robotic uh, problem, because um, uh, provided only few examples, we may, we want to still um, deal with the. Um, meta learner as a probabilistic meta learner. So it should still uh, keep all the options open to, to ask for more and more samples until it's really sure about how to adjust uh, uh, the generative models to learn uh, the specific task on the, on the novel robotic platform. Um, so here I'm also talking about conditional meta learning. So, um, uh, one problem that the, another problem that MAMO cannot solve by itself is the problem that comes from the multimodality of the task distribution. So if you're if you want to train a meta learner that can solve all these different tasks, then uh, potentially the meta learner can have problem dealing with like the multimodality of the data distribution. So MAMO can't handle this neither. Uh, as a result, we uh, proposed an extension of uh, to MAMO, which is both conditional and probabilistic. Um, this is like uh, the general uh, architecture of the framework. Uh, it first learns a latent variable distribution uh, uh, condition on the on the task, and then based on that, it tries to learn um, to generate uh, the parameters of the generative model based on which we can use MAML to update to the final parameters. So we applied this to the our problem formulation. Uh, here is like, uh, I try to demonstrate the latent space of uh, when we are basically mapping each of these robots based on the five trajectories that are sampled from them. As you can see, um, this, net, this framework can group different robots. Uh, so for example, Yumi robots are all mapped in this part of the latent space, Baxter are the red ones, Franco are the blue, and Kinova are the green ones. So this uh, formulation can um, uh, can separate different robotic platform in the latent space and apply, apply different gradient descent rules to different robots because otherwise it's not possible to learn from such a diverse uh, and multimodal data distribution of different robots. Um, here's some, some result showing that, um, okay, if your, uh, uh, if your data distribution is like uh, limited just on a single robotic hardware, uh, you can expect MAML algorithm to also perform quite decently well. But as soon as we're having like uh, more uh, multimodal data distribution that comes from all the 400 robots, things like the memo are not working anymore. And uh, the, the framework that I just introduced, the probabilistic and conditional meta learning extension of memo uh, can handle uh, uh, the multimodal, multi multimodality that exists in this, in the distribution of data much better than uh, other existing algorithms. 
Okay, thank you so much. Today I just very briefly described uh, some of my research about reinforcement learning and uh, using generative models to make reinforcement learning possible on real robotic hardware. And I also talk a little bit about meta learning approach that can be used for uh, improving sim to real transfer learning and also making transfer uh, happen across different robotic platforms, for example, from a human robot to a Baxter robot. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would be happy if you to answer if you have any questions.